All right, everybody, welcome, welcome. Just want to do a quick check on GoToWebinar and YouTube. Are you guys able to hear me okay? Let me know in the question box if you're on GoToWebinar or in the chat on YouTube in the comments. Let me know if you guys are hearing me. Audio sound okay? Let me know in that question box on GoTube or in the comments on YouTube. Awesome. I'm getting some feedback that it looks like you guys are hearing me. Awesome. That is perfect. All right, guys, let's get started. My name is Rachel Taylor. I do these free webinar Wednesdays. I also do the live review. You've maybe seen me there. Uh, live case studies and small group tutoring is primarily where I'm at. Study methods is very near and dear to my heart. I used to work for a college as an NCLEX tutor and a nursing school tutor. And what I really learned there was if you have strong study tools, your chance of success is a lot higher than if you're not studying correctly. So my goal for each and every one of you today is by the end of this hour, you're going to feel stronger in your study methods. So if you've ever felt like, man, my study habits just aren't cutting it, or uh, I wish I could perform better, but I don't know how, that's when you're going to realize that maybe you just haven't been studying effectively. Super understandable because in college, it's quite different from studying for the NCLEX, right? In college, you go from test to test to test. Sometimes you have to work to memorize instead of understand. It's very vigorous. There's a lot of reading. It doesn't mean that you did anything wrong in college. All it means is that sometimes that quick learning doesn't transfer over to understanding and you have to be able to understand to have clinical judgment down and you have to have clinical judgment down in order to pass this next generation NCLEX. So I want to teach you guys how to study effectively, how to study actively. And when you do that, I'm hoping that when you do test questions, they get a little bit easier for you. So I want to know, we're going to use Slido, so you can scan that QR code, or you can go to slido.com and type in the number 4213915, and let me know, where are you joining from today? Where is everyone joining from? So you can join with this QR code, so if you have your cell phone with you, you can just scan that QR code with your camera, or you can go to slido.com and type in that number. New York, welcome. Anyone else? See if we can get Slido working. We're going to use Slido for more than just this, so log on to it if you're able to. Awesome. I see some people typing. Philadelphia, Chicago, welcome. California, amazing, Canada, New Jersey, North Carolina, Toronto, welcome guys. Looks like we have quite a few from California, London, Vancouver, Florida, awesome. Perfect, so we're gonna use Slido quite a bit today. So I want you guys to keep this up because we're gonna be using it more throughout the free webinar. Just try to make this interactive as we can. Awesome, welcome everyone. I'm glad you all are here. So learning styles. With learning styles, we're not gonna take the time to take this quiz today, but learning styles are really important. I want you guys to know what type of learning style you have. Now you may have a combination, but typically you'll primarily use one over the other. So the three type of learning styles we have. With visual learning, this is someone who prefers to see and observe things. You may like pictures, diagrams, you prefer written directions over verbal directions. You've maybe heard this called spatial learning. 
And these are students who are really going to learn when you're presented in a visual way. You may be someone who doodles in your notebook, or you make a lot of lists, or you take a lot of notes. I am primarily a visual learner. I do really well with pictures. I do really well with list making. Then we have auditory learners. These are learners who tend to do better when the subject matter is reinforced by sound. So these students would much rather listen to a lecture than read written notes. They often use their own voice talking out loud in your own home to reinforce concepts and ideas. They also are going to read out loud to themselves. They're not afraid to speak up in class and they're great at verbally explaining concepts. But an auditory learner may be a little bit slower at reading and may often repeat things a teacher tells them. And it's okay if you're a little slower at reading. Guess what? I'm pretty slow at reading. I have to read everything out loud. Then we lastly have kinesthetic learners. These individuals are also called tactile learners. So these are individuals who learn by doing. They learn through experiencing things. So they're somebody who likes to do things with their hands. Now, if you are a kinesthetic learner, one thing I want you to be aware of is when you're studying, you're more likely to need more frequent breaks. So if you're a kinesthetic learner, and you're not taking a break every 30 minutes, you're probably not taking a break often enough when you study. So if you're a kinesthetic learner, every 30 minutes, set your alarm on your phone just to get up, take a five minute break. Now, what learning style do you guys like to use the most? What learning style do you guys use the most? utilize Slido again, and you should just be able to put them in order. Okay, it looks like a lot of visual. Okay, some more kinesthetic. <clears throat> so if you are someone who's visual, something I highly encourage you to do if you're struggling with a disease process, Look at an image of that disease process. Understand that disease process because if you're like me, when my mind goes blank, I maybe can't remember words, but do you know what I can still remember? I can remember pictures. And so because I can still remember what that picture looks like, then I can try to picture it in my head and then I can work through a problem that is in front of me or a question that is in front of me. If you're someone who's an auditory learner, one of the best strategies I have for you, if you feel like, hey, I'm limited on time, record yourself going through notes and you can listen to them, right? You just pop your earphones in and you can review your notes pretty regularly if you are that auditory learner. And then if you're a kinesthetic learner, you learn by doing. This is a little harder for studying for the NCLEX. So what I recommend you do is I recommend you work on concept mapping, I would recommend utilizing a whiteboard when you study. Whatever you can do with your hands, it can make it a little bit easier for you. All right, guys. So understanding how you learn is so important because you need to utilize how you learn and implement those methods to help you become a better studier. Now, I really want to analyze how have you studied in the past? Because knowing how you've studied in the past and understanding, hey, this worked really well, or hey, this maybe didn't work for me, I want you guys to understand that. Because what did work, we want to keep doing. What hasn't worked, we want to eliminate and try something new. So first off, guys, what has worked for you? Let me know in the question box if you're in GoToWebinar or in the comments on YouTube, what's worked for you when you've studied? What are some successful things that you've done to help you study? Let me know in the chat or the question box and go to. Okay, awesome some successful ways that people have studied. They've scheduled regular times to review their notes. They take good quality notes. Awesome. Watching videos. Now somebody said, hey, flashcards have never worked for me. That is so important that you recognize that. 
Why? Because if you're someone that flashcards does not work, don't study flashcards. What does work for you? You know, that note taking. What I find with note taking and how I like to take notes, I take notes my first time and I just use a black pen. And then the second time I go through those notes and I start to use different colors. I start to make my notes really come alive so that I'm drawn to those most important concepts in my notes. Someone said talking to people about topics helps them a lot. Absolutely. One of the best ways to study, guys, is to try to explain that topic to somebody else. Pretend like I'm there with you, or maybe you have a significant other, or you have a kiddo or a pet. Explain these concepts to others, and really it's super helpful if they can ask you questions because then you can really analyze, do I understand this concept? If you can't answer basic questions that they're asking you, you probably don't have a full grasp of that concept. Now, let's talk about different ways you can study. Practice questions is number one. I have to say, I think practice questions is probably one of the most important things you can do because the more you practice, the better you're going to get. The more you practice, the more testing strategy you're going to develop, the more you're going to be able to guess the correct answer, okay? Practice questions is something I need you doing daily. On the days that you're like, oh my gosh, I cannot get anything else done. They're just really, really busy days. What I want you to do on those really crazy days, do 10 practice questions. Do something. Don't skip those days. Because once you skip one or two days, you know what happens? You end up skipping three days and then four and then five and it keeps building. You can take notes. Now, notes is a tricky one. With notes, I really want you taking a little bit of a deeper dive into those notes. Make sure that you're writing them in your own words. Make sure that you can read them and that they're easy to follow. Flashcards. Flashcards, I find, are either very hit or miss for individuals. What I will say is we have an app called Pulsed In, P-U-L-S-E-D-I-N. So if you're like, oh my gosh, I can't write another flashcard. I wrote so many in nursing school. Guess what? We have a whole bunch created for you on this app called Pulston. It doesn't cost you anything. It is free for you. You can go download that app and then you can work on those flashcards. There's a ton for pharmacology. There's a ton of other ones, but pharmacology flashcards are my absolute favorite. Add 10 of those into your study plan each day. Listening is one that works for a lot of students as well. Watch Morgan's on-demand lectures, okay? What I would recommend doing if you're just starting out and you're studying, go with the six-week plan. Follow the six-week plan. And in that six-week plan, there's lectures that you're supposed to do every day where you just listen to Morgan lecture. Now, when you listen, it's important to be active with your listening. So how can you be active with your listening? Well, what I would do after each main concept is pause it. And then I want you to ask yourself, what were the main ideas about this concept? What were the key takeaways about this concept? If you can't tell me that after you've watched it, you weren't actively engaged in the process. We've already talked about teaching somebody else. And then lastly, see it. Look at those images of it. Now, if you're like, I don't know, I've used a ton of resources, I can't figure out what I need to do different, our SurePass combo, okay, it's our number one recommended package, has a great passing rate, okay, a great, amazing passing rate. Students see a lot of success. So you can scan this QR code, or if you have joined in Slido, you can see that in Slido, we have some extra links for you. So if you're an RN, you can click that RN combo. If you're a PN, you can go to that PN combo packages. Click either of those, and that will take you directly to our website where you can purchase the SurePass combo either for the RN or the PN, okay? So again, if you need that combo, Slido is linked right in there for you, or you can scan these QR codes. So let's talk about memorizing versus understanding. When we memorize, 
Okay, that's just remembering a list. We can recall facts, but the problem with this is we cannot apply that knowledge. So I don't really want you to memorize. I want you to work to synthesize, understand. Yes, I call. I know it, but the problem is, is it does not work on the NCLEX. So when I talk about understanding, I'm talking about critically thinking. Are you able to apply that information to new situations? So let's say we're talking about a client who has poor perfusion due to coronary artery disease. Now, maybe the NCLEX asks you about a different disease process that you haven't heard a whole lot about, but you do know it affects perfusion. Well, then you can apply that knowledge. You can apply those concepts that you do know to help you answer the question. This is why understanding is important, guys. We're going to really work, okay, to help you with understanding. Why? Because when you have that understanding, your studying is a lot more effective, you're more likely to answer questions correctly, and then when you're more likely to answer those questions correctly, you're more likely to pass that NCLEX exam. Now, I need you guys to know what you don't know. So how do you know what you don't know? Well, successful studying means, hey, where are my weaknesses and how can I improve on those? So how do you do that? First off, know what you do know. What connections can you make? What areas do you test well in? Where do you feel strong? And then I want you to keep a list of confusing topics. So what I would recommend doing, have a notebook in the front of it, label it confusing topics list, and keep a running tally of, hey, these are my confusing topics. I want you to review those pretty regularly. Why? Because as you review those confusing topics, you're gonna get stronger in them. And the more you review those, well, now they're not a confusing topic anymore. Now you feel really confident in that area. What are some things you guys might put on your confusing topics list? What are some things you might include on there? Let me know in that question box. What are some things you guys would put in your confusing topics list? Maternity, absolutely, that's a tricky one. So then you could even get more specific. What areas of maternity are you struggling with? Maybe it is fetal strips. Maybe it's understanding all of those different tests we might run when an individual is pregnant. Maybe it's understanding GTPAL, okay? Whatever your confusing list is, I want you to be as specific as you can so that way you can go and review those further. Now, how do you know what items you're missing? Well, no matter what resource you're using, you should be using a resource that has questions, right? You should be able to see where you're answering well in and what areas you're answering a little weaker in. So someone in the question box said, hey, mental health, that's my area. So if you've taken a few readiness assessments, you've done some tutor mode questions, and you keep coming up with, hey, I'm struggling in mental health. Well then, okay, let's go back to mental health. Let's go back to those core concepts. What are you missing? What area are you confused on? Utilize your resources fully. I really recommend use one resource and use it to the best of your ability. Sometimes I see students, they're like, hey, I have every resource out there. How do I use them? My best advice to those students is that's way too many. Choose one resource and use it to the best of your ability. Okay. When you get too many resources, it can get very confusing. It can be overwhelming. And typically I see students get so overwhelmed that they just don't do anything at all. So utilize the resource to its fullest extent. Now, the next thing you can do to help you study is create a study plan. I really think it's super important that no matter what method you are using that you have a study plan. If you are not following a study plan today, 
the biggest thing I need you to get from this webinar is to start following one. So what you can do is you can say, okay, here's when I'm taking my NCLEX. So let's say you're taking your NCLEX July 14th. You have exactly one month. I want you to leave the day before as an off day. And then two days before that, I want you to leave as overall review. And then you're just going to fill it in based off your weakest area to your strongest area. Now, make sure that you use the biggest sections. You start with those. The areas that you are struggling with the most should be earlier in your study plan. The areas that you feel pretty confident on should be toward the end of your study plan. My best advice, don't cram. Be realistic. I typically recommend for just about any student I meet with, start with a six-week plan. If you're somebody who's tested multiple times, then I would recommend going up to a 12-week plan, okay? Give yourself some extra time. Don't try to cram this in in two to three weeks. Now, if you just freshly graduated from nursing school, then I'm okay with the three-week plan. But other than that, I wouldn't rush it. I wouldn't cram. Give yourself some time. Why? Because I want your studying to be effective studying. And if you notice when you try to cram, what happens? You've now memorized, you haven't understood the concepts. And then once you know something, move on. Add it to your refresh list for those last couple days. But once you know it, move on to the next topic. Don't move on though until you've got the topic you're working on down. Another thing that I like to recommend is switch up your setting. So what can you do? Well, you could try a coffee shop. You could try going to a library. Now, why do I recommend changing up your setting a little bit? Well, because changing up your setting can be really helpful because when you're in your own home, you're comfortable. You don't really have a whole lot of anxiety. You don't have a whole lot of stressors. But then when you go to that test and you're in a new environment, what happens? Now you're more anxious. Now you're a little more stressed out. So simulate that. How can you do that? Well, take readiness assessments outside of your own home. See if that causes a little anxiety. Can you work through that anxiety? What methods might you utilize? Have a variety of places that are good study environments for you. When I was in nursing school, my classmates and I, we had a local coffee shop we went to all the time. We also had a certain spot in the library we always went. So find your place other than your home and switch it up from time to time. The next thing to keep in mind is reading is really not studying. I am somebody, I can read in my head all day and I will take nothing away from it. I have to read out loud. I have to engage myself in the material. So how can you engage yourself while you're reading? Well, what I always like to do was I like to make a key concept list. So I would do a little pre-read. I would understand, okay, this is what I'm really gonna be reading about. And then I would make sure that after I had done my reading, I could explain those concepts at least the basics of the concepts. If I had that down, then I was good. The other thing I want you to do is I want you to work on highlighting, okay? But highlight what's important, highlight what matters. What I see is that students will highlight everything on the page. I did this for my whole first year of nursing school until I had an instructor tell me, you should only highlight the need to note. You should only highlight the most important stuff. Well, to me, I was like, well, all of this is important, right? What are you most likely to get tested on? That's what you want to highlight. And then once you've highlighted that, can you remember that material? Can you apply that material in two days? Can you apply that material in a week, in three weeks? If you can't apply it later, then you don't have that material down. So when you work to actively study, one thing you can do is you can create a study guide by topic. This again is one of my favorite methods. You can also write your own quiz questions and then be the teacher. Talk through that information. How would you explain it to somebody else? So let's do this quick. Let's write our own quiz question about heart failure. What question would you guys wanna write? 
what's a question you may write? Let me know in the question box or in the comments on Facebook and YouTube. What's a question you would write about heart failure? Maybe how to differentiate left-sided versus right-sided heart failure. Excellent. Maybe you may ask what lab would we want to check in this client with potential heart failure? What symptoms may our client report to us early on? Are there any assessment findings that would stand out to us that would say, ooh, indicator of heart failure? Talk through those concepts. And when you get a question over something, no matter if you get it right or you get it wrong, I really want you to read the entire rationale. And then I want you to ask yourself, what else could have this question asked me? How could have this question been rephrased to ask me something totally different? The goal is that you understand the entire concept, not just the little point that it asked you. For example, if it asks me, what are findings consistent with left-sided heart failure? Okay, I can choose those, those symptoms that are affecting the lungs because that blood is backed up into the lungs. So I choose those answers. But what if I got asked what was consistent with right-sided heart failure? And I didn't know that because I only reviewed the left-sided. You want to be able to understand the whole picture, the entire concept. The more exposure you get to questions, the more likely you are to pass your NCLEX. I would always recommend seeing at least 2,000 NCLEX questions before you take your test, at minimum 2,000 questions. So set a goal for how many practice questions you want to answer in a day. If you follow our six-week plan or our 12-week plan, we've already helped you set that goal. If you're not following those plans, well, maybe set a goal for 85 questions a day. Set that minimum of what you would likely get on the NCLEX. You may have days, though, that you're like, this is not possible. You may say, hey, Rachel, I work 12-hour shifts. How am I supposed to do this? On those days, you may take one or two of those off a week, but then you may notice, okay, on my lunch break, I'm going to answer 10 questions, and that's all I'm going to be able to do today, and that's okay. Then schedule some extra time on your off days to really make up for those days that you couldn't really give it your all. Now, with practice questions, Testing strategy can really help you answer these. So how can you utilize testing strategy? Well, work to break down the question. The first thing I like to ask myself, am I looking for one answer or are there multiple answers? Are there any opposites? If there's opposites, I really draw to them because it's typically one of them and not the other. Opposites don't attract. If it's prioritization, can I use airway, breathing, circulation? Can I use the spectrum of stability? Or maybe Maslow's hierarchy of needs or the nursing process to help me answer that question. Before I look at my answers, I'm already thinking in my head, hey, this is what I think the answer probably would be. And I really like to look at keywords. I like to look at descriptor words in the question because descriptors can change your answer. Just one word in the question could change what you're looking for in the answer. Maybe a keyword is, hey, I'm looking for false answers instead of true. Make sure you pick those out. So let's do a couple practice questions together. So here is our first question. A patient was admitted to the ER due to low serum calcium levels. Upon further examination, he demonstrates carpopedal spasms, reports numbness in his lips and hands. An ECG was taken and revealed a prolonged QT interval. Upon assessment of a client, the nurse should suspect which condition. All right, let's see how you guys do here. Put your answers in the question box or in the chat boxes. Take another 15 seconds. 
Good job, Lori. You got it. All right, let's talk about how I would break this down. So first off, what is this question truly asking me? I know I'm looking for just one answer, but what is the question truly asking me? What condition has a prolonged QT interval? Like it tells me. So which of these conditions would cause a low calcium level? And I know that I'm looking for true answer choices here. I'm looking for those true answers. So I see quite a few opposites. So I have hyperthyroidism versus hypothyroidism. So hyper or hypo? Well, it's not really consistent with either. So I can eliminate A and B right away. Then I have hyperparathyroidism and hypoparathyroidism. Well, which is more consistent? Hypoparathyroidism, right? Why? Because our parathyroid hormone is what goes to the bone and it says, hey, I need you to release some calcium, okay? So because that's what's going to release that calcium, if it's low, well, then we're going to have low serum calcium levels. I like D. Let's keep it. Then I look at E, hypocalcemia due to excessive vitamin D intake. Well, hypocalcemia doesn't happen with excessive vitamin D intake hypocalcemia would happen with low vitamin D intake, right? Because vitamin D is what's responsible for activating that calcium. So if we have too much, we'd actually probably see hypercalcemia. We'd have too much calcium that has been activated in the body. So D is our best answer choice. Nice job, guys. Let's do one more practice question. You're caring for a Jehovah's Witness patient who's experiencing high anxiety, because he needs a blood transfusion to survive. His religion forbids him from having it. Which of the following would be the most appropriate nursing diagnoses for this client? All right, guys, let's see how you do here. Awesome. Great job. All right, guys. So let's look at this question together. So what would be the most appropriate nursing diagnoses for this client? Well, what I like to do is I like to look for words that are in the question as well as the answer. So what do I see here? Well, this client is experiencing high anxiety because why? His religion forbids him from having it. So when I look at a spiritual distress, well, did it say about spiritual distress? No, I can eliminate a B. Mental pain associated with imminent and inevitable death. It didn't say anything about mental pain, and it didn't say that they're gonna immediately die, so I can eliminate B, not consistent. Then I go to C, anxiety related to deciding whether to take a blood transfusion and violate one's religious beliefs or to die. Well, what does it say? It says anxiety. It says blood transfusion in the question, and it says religion. I like C. Let's keep C on the table. It's most consistent. D, social isolation related to being of another religion than the hospital staff. Well, it didn't say that. We can eliminate that. And then E, physical discomfort related to blood transfusion refusal. Well, no, that wasn't the priority in the question. We can eliminate E. C is our best answer here. Nice job, everybody. Great work. Now, some other things that you guys can try is you can try to write your own questions. The most important thing when you write your own questions is that you think through the why. Why is this your answer? Why are these other answers wrong? 
learn from a test writer perspective. It also makes you think through a rationale. That's the most important step when you write your own questions is think through a rationale. So how you want to do this is you want to pick a topic that you're struggling with. Now I want you to think, okay, how is the NCLEX going to actually assess this information? Determine that correct answer first, then determine your incorrect answers. And how would a test writer try to potentially trick you? Utilize those as incorrect answers and understand the why. And then after that, write a rationale for your correct and your incorrect answers. Analyzing your tests. Whenever you take a test, don't just take the test, get the result and say, okay, I'm done. You didn't go through those questions appropriately. What you need to do after you take a test is you need to analyze it. Make a chart or tally the topics that you've missed. What were your two to three weakest areas? Those are the areas that you need to study. After that, the ones that you missed a few questions over, but they weren't your weakest, those should go under the if I have time to review list. What I've seen some students do and it be super successful is they make an Excel spreadsheet of their test analysis. So that way they can see by date, hey, am I improving on which areas? They can also then see, ooh, what areas have I maybe not touched as much or have I not answered as many questions on? I maybe should review those a little more in depth. Now for flashcards. These are great for memorization. Now remember, I want you to focus on understanding, but there is room for some memorization. Some things you just do have to memorize. For example, all of the different insulin types, you really need to memorize that so that way you can apply it, so that you can work to understand it. It's really helpful when you group knowledge together when you learn topics. So what I really like to do is I like to make what is called a Venn diagram, and you can make these right on your flashcards. So if I have topics that are similar, but they're different, what I do is I make two big circles, okay, and they overlap one another. And then in the middle section, I put, these are the things that are the same. Then on those outside sections, I put, these are where these topics differ from one another. So here's an example of a flashcard you could make. So this is what one would look like for an anticoagulant, like heparin. All right. Here's another example of how you guys could do concept map. Okay, you could make these right on your computer. You could hand write these out, but hypertensive meds can go in the middle. And then you can branch out from those. Beta blockers, angiotensin receptor blockers, ACE inhibitors and calcium channel blockers, and then you can branch even further. Now I find it really helpful when you color code these. So notice how this is color coded. It helps it stay organized, not only on paper, but also in your brain a little bit. So what we're doing here is we're studying like information, these hypertensive meds, but then we're also differentiating them. Then when you listen to it, some things that I find helpful when you're listening. You can find time to listen when you're cooking dinner, when you are on a walk, when you're waiting to go into the doctor's office. So you may tell me, hey, I don't have any time to study. What do I do? Start listening to things, okay? Whenever you can, pop in a headphone and start listening to these concepts. Start getting these core concepts down. You can also utilize Pulsed In, that app I referred to earlier. It also has pod pulses. So these pod pulses are basically little podcasts over many different topics. So you could listen to those different topics, again, while you're cooking dinner, while you're waiting to get your kiddos from school. Wherever you're at, you can be studying. Here's just a few more pictures of ways to organize that like information. So here's a good one for insulin. 
insulins I find kind of difficult, but what I find makes it easier is if you start with ones that have the quickest onset, peak and duration, and they increase from there. So your shortest acting to your longest acting insulins, okay? Because when you range them like that, you can then remember them in order and it can help you answer a question. You can also make your own mnemonics. So for example, AFib treatments, you can remember A, B, C, D, E, anticoagulants, beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, diltiazem and EKG, hyperkalemia treatments. You can remember a lick, like licking salt off that margarita. We use albuterol, Lasix, insulin and dextrose, calcium channel blockers again, and k -exalate. So these were some mnemonics that one of our tutors, Lexi, used when she was in nursing school. You guys can create your own to help you remember things a little bit better. And remember, when you see it, it helps you to understand it. So how can you see it? Well, something that's helpful, get a dry erase marker. And then what you can do is you can write lists, you can write meds on your windows, on your mirrors, on anything that has glass, you can start writing things down. I personally use sticky notes and I put them all over my study area. Why? Because every time I pass them, well, then I was studying something. I find it really, really helpful for medications to do this. What I did in nursing school was each week, whatever our med topic was for that week, so maybe cardiac drugs, I would put all the different drugs on sticky notes all over my house. So for example, um, maybe in my closet, I was learning calcium channel blockers and then I would walk out into the hallway and then I'd have my ACE inhibitors and then I'd have my ARBs a little bit further. Really helpful way to study there. The more times you see something and work to understand it, the better you're able to synthesize information. So now that we've talked about this, what study methods do you think you might want to try? Which study methods do you guys think, hey, yeah, that sounds great. I might want to try that one. Let's utilize Slido. So again, to use Slido, remember you can just pull out your mobile device. If you've got one, scan that QR code. If you don't have another device with you, just go to slido.com, type in 4213915. Okay, the sticky notes around the house. I love that one. It is kind of weird, but it helps you. I'm not kidding. It definitely will help you out. Let's see what everyone else is going to try. Teaching myself, awesome. Yeah, working to synthesize the understanding. Awesome. All right, doing flashcards, putting your phone on mute while you're studying. Great idea, working on visuals. Okay, trying flashcards, teaching someone else a difficult concept. The podcast, rewriting. Now, something I will say, guys, with writing notes, write them in your own words. Don't try to write our rationale down. Don't try to write my words word for word. Make them where you understand the words. That's going to help you. Awesome. Writing and drawing on glass. Playing audio in the background. Active reading. Awesome. Nice job, guys. This is perfect. Doing more questions, I definitely recommend the combo of questions and content. I don't recommend doing all the content than all the questions. I recommend pairing them together, okay? I find that students are more successful when they do that. And make sure, hey, that you use all your resources. Use your slides, okay? Make skeleton notes for yourself. Watch the on-demand lectures. Utilize that QBank. Utilize case studies. Um, maybe you can get worksheets, right? Fill those out, pulse in. We've got pod pulses as well as flashcards. Now, if you're like, oh, I have some topics that I am just really struggling with, 
I want you to consider small group tutoring. You're gonna see in Slido, our June small group calendar is attached. So if you're in Slido, you will see that June small group calendar, and you can click that and see what else we have available. Small group tutoring can be really beneficial if you're like, hey, I want to do a two-hour NCLEX review before I take my test. Or maybe you want to just do a few mock NCLEXs or you're really struggling with EKGs, okay? Lauren, she is amazing when it comes to pharmacology. She also does some two-hour NCLEX reviews. Hunter does a lot of our select all that apply small groups. Kate is incredible when it comes to the cardiac system. And Elizabeth does all of our different the plan you find hey i'm struggling those errors it's okay because you can join a small group and we can help you there all right guys let's talk next a little bit about time management so open up slido let me know how good are you with time management how do you feel when it comes to time management Okay, so two to four is where everyone's sitting at right now. Okay, looks like a lot of people are giving this a three. So let's talk a little bit more about time management. Now, why do I find time management is so important? If you don't have time management down, you may have all the correct study tools, but you're not able to apply them correctly because you are not managing your time. So where you should start is by getting organized. Make sure you have a planner or some type of time management system and stick to it. What I mean by this is I want you to schedule your study time. So you maybe work from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. So when are you studying? You may have to get up at 4 a.m. and study till 6.30, and then you may have to study from 9 to 10 p.m. at night. Think about your specific circumstance and how you're going to fit that study time in. On average, do you guys know about how many hours a day you should try to study? Anyone know? Anyone have any guesses of how many hours you should try to study each day? About two to four hours of study time a day is what you want to aim for. This might seem pretty impossible, so that's why I recommend get out a calendar, put your have tos down first. Once you've wrote out all the have tos, then fill in your study time next. And then your want tos write in after you filled in when you're gonna study. Now, make sure to set goals with your studying. When you set those weekly goals, okay, when you set those weekly goals, do you know what they help you do? They help motivate you when you obtain them. Stay motivated. Well, how can you get motivated? Remember your why. Why did you go to nursing school? Why do you want this? Okay. When you remember your why, that is going to help you when things are hard. That's going to help you when you feel like, oh, I just don't know if I can do this. So when you start to lack that motivation, think back to your why. Now, effective study time is really important. You want a clean and organized environment. You don't want to be in a room where you see all of the laundry you need to fold, or maybe your dirty dishes piled up by a sink, or maybe your kiddos are running back and forth, okay? How can you find a little bit better of an area? For me in nursing school, we did not have, okay, a very big house. So what I used, I took all the clothes out of a closet <laughs> and I made that my study area. So that way I had one area where I could keep everything I needed to study. Now somebody said, man, two to four hours of study time in a day, I feel like my brain shuts off at that point. I would not do four hours of studying straight. What I would recommend doing is that you do you know, 50 minutes on, take a 10 minute break, 50 minutes on, take a 10 minute break and do that several times throughout the day. Some at the beginning of the day, some at the end of the day. And if you're someone, remember, who's a tactile learner, you need more frequent breaks. So you may need to do 30 minutes on, five or 10 to 15 minute breaks. What I always say is if you're studying and you're like, 
man, I'm not getting anything out of the study session. It's time to put the books away, stop studying for a little bit and come back to it later, okay? If you are not getting anything out of that session, I don't want you to get burnt out. Take a little break, come back to it later, give it your all the next time. I want you to give 100% every time you show up to study. Make that study time effective. You're going to see a lot more benefit out of it. And get started early. Procrastination is our worst enemy. Your brain, though, can understand more in a month. So let's just say you study one hour every day for 30 days. Okay, You're going to learn more than if you study 30 hours in a week. Okay, Because your brain has time to synthesize and work to understand over that time. Now, if you're like, I don't have this time management thing down, I need more help with this, then I want you guys to consider intense prep. Intense prep, we have open slots on June 26th. Just about every time we open intense prep, it fills. So if this is something you are interested in, I would sign up today. You don't want to wait because once we fill the slots, we won't open anymore for this start date. Okay, We have start dates every two weeks. What this is, is this is six weeks. You have a daily um, calendar outlined with exactly what you're going to do. It is very intense. There are 12 exclusive live lectures, six small group tutoring sessions, and six small group feedback sessions. This also includes an ebook. You're going to have practice questions, worksheets, cheat sheets. You're going to have access to an instructor, one of us, who can give you feedback, okay? You're also going to do case studies. Each group only allows 20 students, 20 students. So our open slots, our next one's that June 12th date filled up. June 26th is our next day. If you're like, hey, that QR code's not working for me, you can also find that in the links in Slido. I included that there so you guys can click that intense prep. Click that and it will bring you to where you can sign up for it. All right, guys, let's finish off the day talking about test anxiety. So I'm curious to see, where's everyone at? Do you struggle with test anxiety? If you rate it a one, you don't have any test anxiety at all. If you rate it a five, you have pretty severe test anxiety. Let's see where everybody is at today. And if you don't wanna answer, you don't have to. We won't see your answers though. I won't know who is answering what, I should say. Okay, it looks like a lot of you guys are struggling with test anxiety. About 83% have severe. And then fours and fives. I don't see any ones. Okay, a few threes. So if you rated it a one or a two, that's great. Okay, that's a good place to be at. If you're rating it a three, okay, we have a little work to do. Fours and fives, we've got a lot of work to do. If you rated this a five and you haven't sought out medical help from your doctor, I would definitely start there. But test anxiety, some things that I would just recommend. Test anxiety really comes in as a performance stressor. We have this feeling of I have to do well or it's going to have this huge impact. And don't get me wrong, I understand that passing or not passing the NCLEX can have a big impact, but that is not what I want you to focus on. I want you to focus on doing the best you can on this test, on every question that you see. So what I see happen is we get these outside stressors along with our own personal stress. Maybe it's a job you've accepted. Maybe it is uh, family members asking, hey, when are you going to take that test? When are you going to take that test? And then we have our own maybe self-doubts too. This leads to what's called thought blocking. And this is where your mind goes blank. You just cannot previously recall information that you knew before. And what you need to do is you need to work to prevent it. So how can you prevent it? If you have just a little bit of test anxiety, that's actually a good thing. Mild test anxiety can increase your test performance because it causes a heightened awareness. It's once you get to those moderate, the moderate severe levels that you start to experience symptoms like your mind goes blank, you're nauseous, you're tachycardic. That's when your testing is impaired. What I see is a direct correlation with lack of confidence and an increase of test anxiety. Now, this isn't for everyone, just quite a few students that I've noticed over my two years of education. So what I want you to do if this is you, I want you to work on boosting your confidence. Well, how can you do that? Work on positive self-talk. 
Work on getting four highs or very highs on readiness assessments consecutively. Get some passes on those CAD exams. Maybe sit in on some tutoring sessions and see what a tutor thinks of where you're at. All of those things can help build your confidence and help you feel ready for your exam. And make sure that you know how to answer those NCLEX style questions. Testing strategy, okay, testing skills can definitely help you do better on this test and decrease that anxiety. If that anxiety still sneaks in, I want you to work to combat it. You can utilize positive self-talk. I find that a lot of times we can be our own worst enemies. Talk positively to yourself. Instead of saying, oh my gosh, I'm never going to pass this test, I want you to say, you know what? I've got this. I've worked really hard for this, and I'm going to show up and do the best I can. Work to take in nice, big, deep breaths. Hold it and exhale it. When you do that, it puts pressure on your vagus nerve, and it can remove you from your fight or flight, which can then allow you to critically think through the questions. You may notice when you're anxious, you get a lot of tension in your shoulders and in your neck. So release that. Tense up and release. Tense up and release. And then redirect your focus. What's this question asking you? Don't try to self-evaluate during the exam. Don't try to count your number of SATA questions. Focus on what's right in front of you and do the best question on every question that you get. Now, if you're like, oh, I'm really struggling with test anxiety, I really want you to consider private tutoring, okay? I have found that private tutoring really helps people work through that test anxiety. All of our tutors have experience with test anxiety. To do that, you can scan there to book, or what you can do is you can go into Slido under those um, links, you can click right on to private tutoring. Everyone on this list is amazing, okay? We have an amazing tutor team. Also, if you're like, oh, I don't know who to pick, I don't know which tutor would be a good fit, Email us at nclextutors at archerreview.com and I will help personally pair you with somebody on our tutor team to make sure you get someone who would be a great fit for you. Oh, all right. And lastly, I just want to end with a little advice for NGN. When you have next gen questions, just some study strategies for this, testing strategies. Read the question first if it's a standalone item. That way, when you go and you're reading through all of that information, that case study, you know exactly what the question is looking for. Have your whiteboard out and the key info shorthanded on a whiteboard so you can get used to going through the material and the amount of time it'll take you to do those NGN items. And just go through the information one to two sentences at a time. Don't try to rush it. But also, don't go so slow that these case study items are taking you 10 or 15 minutes. All right, guys, I want to take a little time for questions. It looks like there are already quite a few in here. So if you have any further questions, put those in to the Q&A section. And let me take a few moments to answer some of these. So tips for anyone who feels like they have a below average attention span. If this is you, more frequent breaks, you need to work to be more engaged with the material. If you're someone who you're like, man, I get bored just listening to lecture, engage with the lecture, okay? So in the on-demand, Morgan may post questions to you. Answer those. Answer them out loud. Then go explain them. Explain the why out loud. Make a concept map while she's lecturing. Do something with your hands with the material to make it where you can pay attention a little bit better. All right. Contraindications with shellfish and CT contrast. Um, it is no longer a contraindication. Okay. That is correct. Um, they may, you know, say, oh, yep, I've got a shellfish allergy, but typically they can still get that contrast. All right. Group studying with friends helps. Awesome. Any tips for someone following the study plan, but scores are staying consistently on the lower end? Okay, I want you to stop taking questions for a day. and I want you to really analyze where are you at. Maybe you're missing a key concept. Go back, review those concepts, and then go back into the study plan. I really want you to try to take about two minutes, okay? Two minutes or less, okay, to really answer those 
questions. Two minutes or less on the average question. Some may take you a little more, some may take you a little less. All right, guys, did you enjoy the free webinar today? Did you get something out of this webinar? Awesome, it looks like you feel like you got something out of it. One means nope, didn't get anything out of this. Five is it was awesome. I absolutely got this. All right, awesome. So our next webinar Wednesday, it's a little bit away, it's going to be July 5th, okay? It's gonna be July 5th, and that's going to be how to NCLEX, a first time test taker's guide to the NCLEX. So if you're like, I don't understand Pearson View. I've never taken the test. I don't know what the testing center is going to be like. This is the free webinar you want to do. We will those links to all social media as we get a little bit closer to that day. Okay. So we're going to have that on July 5th. July 5th. So keep that in mind. We will post it all over Facebook. For sure, that's typically where we post all of these. It'll be on our Facebook story. Um, it'll be just a random post on Facebook. So look out for that a little bit before July 5th. All right, are there any last minute questions I can answer? Okay, looks like we got everything. Thank you guys for being here today. Thank you for choosing Archer Review. Again, if you have any further questions, please email us, nclextutors at archerreview.com. Bye, everybody. I hope you have a great day.